गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टी वी दिस इज द चेन्नाई ऑर्थो स्पाइन मीट वी आर लाइव नाउ एंड यू कैन टेक इट अहेड थैंक यू थैंक्स डॉक्टर नीरज गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी आई एम डॉक्टर सुधर एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ चेन्नई ऑर्थो स्पाइन सोसाइटीज वेबिनार ऑन थोरको लंबा इंजरी सो दिस इज वेबिनार सीरीज एंड वी स्टार्टेड फोर मंथ्स बैक so we have covered almost uh, the entire uh, spectrum of uh, spinal trauma and now we are in the final stage and as we all know uh, any spinal injury uh, is not or the treatment of spinal injured patients is not complete without a proper rehabilitation protocol so that is why we wanted to make uh, uh, sure we have to we wanted to make um, i mean we want to clear uh, the doubts that most of us have during the rehabilitation protocol because as surgeons we all feel that surgery is the most important thing but uh, uh, actually rehabilitation is the most important thing and uh, surgery actually contributes very minimal uh, when it comes to a spine injury especially when they are quadriplegic or paraplegic so i would like to uh, in, uh, welcome all the panelists our char persons dr nalli uraj dr karthik kailash and today the expert panel we Dr. Nalli Oraj, Dr. Vengatesh from CMC Valur, Dr. Karthik Kailashar, and uh, uh, Dr. He- Henry, who is the head of the Department of Physical Medicine, CMC Valur. Dr. Vengatesh, as we all know, is the head of uh, Spine Surgery, uh, Christian Medical College Valur. Along with them, we have uh, three other guests who are spine injured patients, and uh, they will be sharing their experience after spine injury and the rehabilitation which they underwent. and uh, uh, they are leading a normal life after spine injury and uh, they will be uh, willing to clarify all our doubts regarding the rehabilitation protocol uh, i would like to thank uh, dr fanikiran also who is uh, our team uh, who has taken the efforts in uh, hosting the show so no more to you nali sir thank you all yeah uh, thank you dr sudhir uh, good evening everybody i think is karthik there no is he has he joined he is joining sir he is joining yeah okay now um, as uh, dr sudhir said we have covered the entire uh, spectrum of uh, a complete without uh, uh, a session on rehabilitation so i uh, see we normally uh, do not have such sessions in the various uh, conferences we have seen it's been the same as far as the rehabilitation of spinal injury is concerned because we have a lot of um, Uh, facilities to treat the uh, spinal injured and then manage them in the acute and the subacute phase whereas uh, long term rehabilitation i think uh, there are a very few uh, like handful of institutions in our country where we uh, provide rehabilitation of the spinal injured but this is really surprising because in 2000 when i visited uh, dhaka bangladesh they have a, a, a really a wonderful uh, rehabilitation uh, center in uh, savar around uh, 20 25 kilometers from uh, dhaka and i was really surprised and when i spoke there i i, I told them that uh, yeah, this facility is not even available in india even in fact uh, the spinal injury center had not developed then the one present delhi and the other centers w- uh, which have uh, which are now uh, providing good rehabilitation facilities were not there then so i think uh, the other countries are uh, um, are spending a lot of uh, effort in the rehabilitation which is very important because we cannot just uh, leave uh, alone these uh, uh, very unfortunate uh, victims the spinal injury patients uh, and i think uh, more stress should be on uh, having more uh, rehabilitation centers in future so with uh, uh, this small remark uh, i would like to um, uh, start the session uh, uh, with the uh, management of uh, the rehabilitation in the acute phase uh, of the spinal injury so after this this is going to be followed by um, a session on the management of the paraplegics and the quadriplegics and i think this is going to be a, a very good session uh, especially um, the faculty from cmc will we heard a lot of uh, things about uh, the rehabilitation facilities in uh, uh, cmc pur and we are going to get to know what's happening there and in addition like uh, it's uh, uh, this program is going to be a little different with uh, we are going to uh, interact with the, the victims of the spinal inj- uh, injury and these patients i think we will hear a first hand information uh, from these victims on how they are progressing how well they have been rehabilitated i think this is going to be a very good uh, um, uh, program uh, in fact this is going to be more interesting than the other three programs in this series 
and uh, let me uh, start with the, the uh, acute phase rehabilitation spine injury because this is uh, uh, going to be just an introduction and uh, let me start uh, my uh, projection yeah henry i think you got to uh, yeah yeah your the screen is coming yeah right So uh, the uh, acute and the subacute phase rehabilitation, the spinal cord injury. See, this is uh, I am going to share my experience on what uh, I have uh, experienced uh, in uh, Madras Medical College, one of the centers where the uh, spinal uh, injured patients uh, uh, are taken care of. Uh, at a time, we have around uh, forty patients, forty spinal injured patients uh, in our wards. Uh, this is a 350 bedded unit and we have around 40 patients at a time. In fact, even this COVID period, uh, I was told today that the census is around 25. 25 spinal injured patients have, who have been admitted waiting for treatment. So that is the uh, uh, load, workload uh, of the spinal injured in uh, Madras Medical College. So uh, I would like to share, I, I'm going to share a few videos also, which was shot, uh, uh, I think it was in 2000, uh, I mean 1995 in fact, so, uh, oh, as old as that. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I'm really surprised uh, when I saw these videos because uh, this is the uh, literature uh, based on which I'm going to, I prepared this talk. And this literature, to, as late as 2015, uh, says what all we were doing uh, right from 1975 when this unit was started. So I was really feeling happy that uh, we've been uh, doing this uh, a wonderful work over the years as far as spinal, care of the spinal cord injuries, uh, injured is concerned. Now, uh, going subject proper, early rehabilitation is important to prevent joint contractures and loss of muscle strength, conservation of bone density, and to ensure normal functioning of the respiratory and the digestive systems, according to this uh, paper, uh, uh, the, the paper on which I'm going to base my talk. Now, uh, observational retrospective studies are reported an association between uh, increasing uh, time for injury to uh, rehabilitation and poorer quality of life and performance of activities of daily living. So this suggests that a delay in the initiation of specialized rehabilitation could be detrimental. So what we say is uh, there is no time. Like we cannot just wait. Uh, okay, we'll wait till the patient recovers, when uh, uh, settles down. Uh, first, we'll treat him uh, like surgically, manage him, and then finally, once he is settled down, and then we'll start the rehabilitation. It's not like so. The rehabilitation has to be started as soon as the patient is admitted. Now, uh, I've been given the topic: uh, man, uh, the acute and subacute phase of uh, rehabilitation of the spinal cord injury. Now, what, what is that acute and subacute? See, the rehabilitation of individuals with spinal cord injury can be divided into three phases. They are the acute, subacute, and the chronic. So, uh, the acute and the subacute periods, when combined, they generally correspond with the natural history of neuro, neuro recovery, which is around 12 to 18 months post injury. So, we can say the phase of neuro recovery until we get a neuro recovery, that phase is called the acute and subacute periods, while the chronic phase is the period when the neuro recovery has plateaued. I think this is quite clear now. So once that uh, the rec neuro recovery is uh, stopped, then we call it the uh, chronic phase. Now uh, we are going to uh, uh, describe the rehabilitation during the acute and the subacute phases, focusing on the following uh, headings: the preventing the secondary complications, promoting and enhancing neuro recovery, maximizing the function, and establishing optimal conditions for long-term maintenance of health and the function. So you should be uh, knowing the difference between how, what is different between acute subacute phase and uh, and uh, chronic phase rehabilitation. In the chronic phase, compensatory or assistive approaches are often used, whereas in the acute and subacute phase, there is a greater emphasis on techniques that underlies the underlying impairments and promoting neuro recovery. Uh, mainly, our, uh, 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 we concentrate on promote enhancing the promoting and enhancing neuro recovery and maximizing the order of the function is there then. And uh, the chronic phase, I think uh, Henry is going to talk later. Now, starting with the first uh, uh, heading, preventing secondary complications, uh, I'm going to just be very brief. So these are the secondary complications which we encounter in spinal cord injury. I think you are uh, well aware that the complications are pressure ulcers, uh, bowel and bladder control dysfunctions, deep vein thrombosis, spasticity, and hydrotopic ossification. We'll go one by one now. So prevention and cure of uh, pressure ulcers. So uh, uh, prevention of pressure ulcers when uh, when lying in bed or as well as sitting in wheelchair, very important. It is not just uh, pressure sores uh, when, when lying in bed alone, but once you mobilize the patient and then he's going to mobilize on wheelchairs, they, even then, you've got to be very uh, uh, cautious in preventing pressure sores. 
and most important thing is education uh, of the patients as well as the caregivers and uh, the various methods i'm not going to details like you can use uh, water mattresses and then pneumatic mattresses are available there and then the various uh, methods of preventing pressures like keeping the skin clean and then uh, and we uh, normally don't encourage application of any um, like powders or any ointments or anything to the back or oil anything to the back and then uh, most important thing whatever said and done you, you may have a water mattress or a pneumatic mattress whatever you have turning regularly is very important you got to turn regularly and check the pressure regions for uh, development of pressure source and that is very very important i think i would like to that's the reason why i highlighted here now so necrosis then once uh, the uh, ulcer has developed then you got to go in for the management of the pressure source like in the form of a necrosis debridement washing and cleaning the wound and bandaging everything and uh, do not forget that the good nutrition supply both the multi mineral and vitamin is very very important in the management of pressure source and this is the uh, short video you can see how they are this is one aspect i i, I you should concentrate the positioning of the joints with the sandbags available and then uh, the due care is given to the uh, uh, catheters and the urinary drain and see how uh, this patient is being uh, turned and the most important thing is this, what is one of the log rolling method madras log rolling method is uh, quite familiar uh, 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 everywhere then during those period and then this is the, the advantage is that a single person can turn the patient you need do not have need not have two or three person do this procedure and then this is how the patient is turned to the sides so similarly the patient is again see uh, how how important it is to position the uh, joints there uh, i'm going to talk about this later in the uh, uh, lecture and this is very important you to position it with use of sandbags and with each turning i think the same uh, protocol is being followed and the uh, how the um, Uh, urinary uh, catheter is uh, positioned uh, is plastered to the abdomen to prevent the uh, penoscrotal uh, fistula so all care has to be taken so this is regarding the turning of the patient to prevent pressure sores now coming to the bladder and the bowel care the bladder care is uh, bladder dysfunction is one of the main uh, problem bladder and uh, bowel care, um, impairment functional impairment is very very uh, uh, problematic as far as spinal cord injury is concerned and then uh, as far as the as far as bladder care is concerned we got to do neurodynamic studies and determine the type of bladder and then accordingly you can uh, institute the rehabilitation so the most important thing is the training for self clean intermittent catheterization this is very very important this is uh, we norm uh, we normally started by around the 7th or 6th or 7th day when spinal shock is over and then we start the patient on training them for self clean intermittent catheterization and uh, this can be done if the upper limbs are uh, normal paraplegic you can start with self catheterization whereas if it's going to be quadriplegic then you got to uh, take the help of the attendants and uh, most important thing is got to ensure that is enough intake of water is there uh, it is not just enough you just empty the bladder alone but you got to concentrate on the uh, water intake as well as the uh, uh, management of the urinary tract infection whenever they appear and you got always uh, be cautious about it and then various drug therapies may also be useful and uh, of late uh, intravesical botox injection has been found to be useful we, we do not have any experience on that and then coming to the bowel care it's very important that the patient should be trained on the uh, bowel care and then uh, medications uh, may be used to soften uh, the uh, motion formed and you can uh, most important thing is again combined with the intake water of bladder care program so adequate to water intake is also here important as far as the bladder cover is care is concerned now with deep vein thrombosis one another problem uh, of course you must you know uh, you are familiar with that use of anticoagulants the blood thinners then use of pneumatic uh, compression devices and the simple one is the graduated compression stockings which can be worn for uh, they say for at least 3 to 4 months and then you got to uh, supplement with the exercise regular exercises and uh, always be um, cautious about uh, the development of deep vein thrombosis you got to uh, uh, make a uh, I mean clinical suspicion should be there and also do the appropriate investigations like ultrasound scan and then treat it when they have developed now one another important problem is the development of hypertension uh, a uh, uh, feature of atomic dysreflex especially in spinal cord injury in the upper thoracic levels uh, the patient should be uh, uh, educated about it and then even the caregiver should be conscious about it and then that's the reason why we got to periodically check the blood pressure and uh, most importantly then you can institute the treatment, uh, drug therapy for hypertension and most importantly you got to check the bowel and the bladder and the other triggers any like impacted bowel can also produce uh, i mean aggravate i mean uh, set in motion the autonomic dysplasia with the rise in hypertension and even uh, as uh, simple issues like uh, tight garments can also uh, in raise the pressure due to autonomic dysplasia so you got to take uh, you got to look into all these triggers and try to prevent all these 
Now, the next one is the orthostatic hypertension. The orthostatic hypertension is likely to be found in patients with a long period of lying in bed, and um, syncopic can be seen in these patients while sitting and being lifted up due to low blood pressure. So, the mechanism of uh, the orthostatic hypertension is that are uh, the cardiovascular deconditioning as a result of prolonged bed rest, excessive pooling of blood in the organs and the viscera due to the reduced uh, efferent sympathetic nervous activity, and loss of reflex vasoconstrictor effect of arterial baroreceptors caudal to the level of injury. And the lack of the contracting muscular effects of the lower extremities to venous pooling and the reduced plasma volumes as a consequence of hyponatremia. So these are various causes. And then how to manage these? A tilt table may be useful for patients with this condition. Uh, you, can, you can start with 45 degrees for 30 minutes and gradually the degrees increased according to the patient's uh, uh, complaints in the state. And standing upright stimulates the blood pressure reflexly to a sufficient and persistent limit uh, when the patient becomes uh, uh, comfortable. And the patients adapt to sit and stand and are prepared to transfer and balance. So next phase is uh, to go in for transfer and uh, to develop balance. So when the patient comes to the upright position with the tilt table, the patient should be in a sitting position on the edge of the bed for three to four times a day. And the balance exercise should be done to maintain his position. And independent sitting on the edge of the bed is very important for wheelchair use, enabling wheelchair transfer. And the purpose of this rehabilitation period should focus on stability and strength education for sitting and transportation. So the next phase is the uh, mobilization of the patient out of bed. So uh, then the next problem is the management of spasticity. Uh, this is by use of various medications can be used and there can be phenol blocks uh, uh, by using the ultrasound scan to locate the nerves. Uh, and Botox injection has been found to be useful in uh, overcoming the spasticity. And uh, use of orthotics can have also been found to be useful. And then if it's going to be very troublesome, then you can you can go in for operator nerve denervation, a surgical procedure uh, performed in this orthopedic department. Now, the heterotopic ossification, uh, we normally do not uh, uh, pay much attention to it, but uh, it's been found that uh, abnormal bone formation, soft tissues around the large joints below the level of the portal injury is most common uh, around the hips. And the report incidence is as high as 16% to 53%. We normally do not uh, uh, pay more attention to this. And the onset of uh, heterotopic is usually one to four months following spinal cord injury, but it may develop late after surgery or local trauma. So the initial trauma, uh, most important thing is that the initial treatment, if it's going to begin early, uh, this can reverse the ossification process. That's very, that's really, uh, uh, really heartening as far as this is concerned. So hence, uh, you should be on the guard looking out for this heterotopic and institute, uh, institute early treatment. Now, continuing with the acute and subacute phase rehabilitation spinal cord injury, we have. Uh, uh, finish the uh, secondary complications, how you manage them. And then the next, we will be concentrating on promoting and enhancing the recovery and maximum function and maximizing the function. Now, under this, we will be uh, dealing with these uh, five headings, the respiratory management, maintaining the range of motion, the prevention of deformities, a selective strengthening of the uh, limb muscles and the mobilization. Now, starting with the respiratory management, recent studies have shown that early mobilization plays an important role in the prevention of pulmonary function decline and the development of muscle strength. So we do not really do not uh, concentrate on this, but it is very important that uh, this factor has to be uh, kept in mind, the respiratory management is spinal cord injured. So breathing exercise should be carried out and taught, and its importance should be explained to complete and incomplete paraplegic and patients during the acute phase in order to protect the lung capacity. And during this period, the number of exercise should be kept at the maximum level depending upon the patient's tolerance. So various uh, methods of uh, uh, respiratory conditioning can be done. Like you can have assisted coughing or then the chest physiotherapy, uh, asking them to do deep breathing, and then you've got to have um, a strengthening exercise to chest muscles. All these things can be done. Uh, next is the uh, maintaining the range of motion and prevention of the deformities. So this is uh, the first thing would be a joint splinting and positioning. I think you saw in the previous video where uh, the sandbags were used to uh, position the joints. So the positioning of the joints is important in order to protect the articular structure and the maintain the optimal muscle tone. And the sandbags and pillows can be useful in positioning. These are the ones which are commonly used. And if the pillows and the sandbags are not able to provide positioning, it can be achieved with plaster sprints or more rigid orthotics. So ankle foot orthosis, knee ankle foot orthosis, static ankle foot orthosis, etc., are mainly used for this purpose. Next is the, the most common and important complication is development of joint contractures and stiffness during this period. And it's been found that at least one joint contracture has been reported in about 66% of patients with the, uh, within one year. The various, the, you can see the uh, statistics on all, uh, the incidents of the various joints being affected. So if the patient is paraplegic or tetraplegic, intensive passive range of movement exercise is a must to maintain the lower extremities to be compatible to the level of injury. And the range of motion exercise prevent contractures and maintain functional capacity. And these exercises should be done in a flaccid, if it's going to flaccid paralysis, in the flaccid period at least once a day. And if it's going to be a spastic one, it, it should be done at least two to three times a day. 
and the uh, when the muscles are flaccid during the spinal shock period, uh, and the flaccidity is replaced spasticity after the period of spinal shock. So, and uh, this has to be remembered. And the uh, flexion contracture of the hip may develop, and this has to this can be managed by prone positioning at the regular intervals and along with the range of movement exercise in all directions. Now, the passive exercise should be done intensively to resolve the contractures and muscle atrophy and uh, pain during the acute period of hospitalizing patients with complete injury. So, we just see a sh short clipping here uh, on how it was done in uh, our unit. See the, uh, the passive exercise being performed by, I mean, administered by the uh, physiotherapist on these patients. Almost all the joints are put through a good range of movement. And uh, see that the patient has to do the respiratory management also there. The deep breaths are being taken and then uh, good uh, physio, chest physiotherapy is very important and then the patient has to take deep breaths and uh, so the respiratory management is uh, also taken care during the daily physiotherapy uh, program. Now, um, then comes the active exercise to strengthen the uh, available muscles. And there is strong evidence to indicate that people with partial paralysis following spinal cord injury get stronger with time. And that uh, this evidence comes from the longitudinal studies which uh, show changes in the strength and neurologic status with accompanying changes in the function. This is one just such study which has shown that it improves uh, gradually uh, with the uh, active exercise being administered. It is generally assumed that these increases are due to a combination of central and peripheral factors. The peripheral factors include muscle hypertrophy, and the central factors include neural adaptations either at the site of the injured spinal cord or even possibly within the brain. Now, the most important point is strengthening of the upper extremities to the maximum level in the acute period of rehabilitation patients with complete paraplegia. Uh, this uh, empowers the, uh, the shoulder, uh, the empowering exercise for shoulder rotation are uh, proposed for using crutches, swimming, and electrical bicycles and walking. And at the end of the acute phase, strong upper extremities are needed for the independent transfer from the bed. So active and resistant exercise to strengthen the muscles of the upper extremity should be initiated at the earliest possible period. And weight and resistant exercise can be applied with dumbbells in the bed, depending on the patient's muscle strength. So the patient can also be fitted to the uh, physiotherapy department to administer exercise also once they are uh, uh, mobilized out of bed. Then electrical stimulation may be useful uh, alternative if extreme fatigue occurs while strengthening the muscles. And shoulder exercise performed with elastic bandages were found to be effective to reduce the shoulder pain. Now, the uh, uh, last phase is the mobilization of the patient. Uh, uh, before mobilization, corsets and braces are very useful in uh, immo immobilizing the injured spine, uh, whether they are treated conservatively or even after uh, uh, surgical stabilization. And corsets are used for fixation and supporting the spine while moving on to a sitting position after the end of the bed interval. And uh, various uh, hyperaxial corsets or plaster or plastic body jackets are used. Uh, and these are very useful restriction movements in all directions. Now, uh, the, uh, mobiliz uh, the next is the mobilization out of bed. The functional goals must prepare the patients for movements such as sitting. First, you've got to mobilize the patient in the bed and then later onto the wheelchair. And the, uh, uh, the range of movement ex and stretching exercise are used for functional activities. And exercise for sitting, balance, and strengthening of the upper limb should be done at the beginning. And the patients who can tolerate sitting can begin to push up with static and dynamic balancing training to transfer to the wheelchair. The next phase is the once mobilization of, bed, uh, of the patient in the bed is uh, complete, then we, we attempt to uh, transfer them onto the wheelchair. Now, the uh, mobilization out of bed is by the wheelchairs, walkers, or crutches. And uh, the wheelchair is the most important tool for spinal cord injury patients to be mobile. And ideally, wheelchairs must allow for optimal mobility, protect the skin integrity, and maintain the normal anatomical posture. And a battery-assisted wheelchair is appropriate for injuries at the upper segments, whereas a manual wheelchair is preferred at the lower levels. If the upper limbs are normal, you can use the manually operated wheelchairs. And the uh, most important thing is the wheelchair dimensions, such as the height, pelvic width, seat length, backrest seat, and the arm support should be specifically prescribed for each patient. You can't just uh, have one wheelchair and use it for all the other patients. So you've got to be very specific for each individual. And lastly, uh, the uh, most uh, common problem is the, uh, the manpower issue. If the physiotherapist or the allied health staff in the clinic are not present or are not sufficient, the patient's family should be included in the rehabilitation team from the initial days. And the importance and necessity of the uh, rehabilitation must be shared with the patients and their relatives. 
So to conclude, early rehabilitation is important to prevent joint contractures and the loss of muscle strength, conservation of bone density, and ensure normal functioning of the respiratory and digestive system. And rehabilitation involves a team and a patient-centered approach. But a, a word of caution, even in these individuals who make significant gains in the rehabilitation may experience difficulty when returning to pre-injury activities. So this has to be kept in mind also. Thank you. Yes, Karthik is there? Still, Karthik is not connected. No, he is there, sir. He is. He is there. Yeah, yeah, Nali. Yes, Karthik. Hi, hi. Yeah, Nali. How are you doing? Oh, fine, fine. fine thank you. So, sorry, I had gone a late, but I heard your lecture there. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. My, my lecture is over. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I heard it. I was there. <laughs> yeah, okay. I saw the video. So I think, too. Uh, this is to just uh, cover up the acute phase uh, management. Uh, in uh, any patient who's admitted right from the time of admission in the hospital, and then we just carry out all these things now. So uh, you saw some few illustrations where, like, this was how the patients were managed at uh, Madras Medical College. And uh, shall we next go to the move to the next uh, topic? Yes, sir, yes. I, I must I must congratulate you only for getting the videos from 1995-1997 onwards. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right now. Yeah. Uh, like uh, all the patients, whether they are treated conservatively or surgically, they are sent to the uh, Regional Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine at KK Nagar. And there okay. they are uh, 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 put on acute uh, or subacute uh, rehabilitation. And then once they are, they complete this phase and they are discharged. Okay, on an average, how, do, how long do they stay there? Is there uh, they any... stay for roughly around uh, two weeks. In fact, the full rehabilitation is given there and they are followed up also. Okay. They, are, they have follow-up visits there. And then uh, the one thing which I don't think they have a, a home follow-up. No one goes home and then sees that. Uh, but they are made to come oh. back and then uh, that's how it goes on. Right, sir. Any, any further questions or shall we move on? Uh, uh, funny, I have yeah. one question. Do you have? Uh, yes, Can I ask please. one question? To... Yes, Murli, yeah. Yeah, Nali, sir, Murli. Sir, if, uh, if you have a young uh, RTC chap in an RTC, D8, D9 uh, dislocation, complete ACIA, he is coming to you within three hours of injury and you are stabilizing within on the day or next day. So after that, what is your uh, protocol? You uh, mobilize him in wheelchair immediately or you leave them in a bed because some of the units say one week flat bed rest, optimize the cord, they give the chance for the cord to recover. So they continue with the flat nursing like Sheffield and some other units and all. Big unit. So I just want to know whether you mobilize them the next day in a wheelchair and then how do you, what is your immediate protocol within for the first one week? Yes. So, uh, uh, see, there is no like, fixed protocol. No? The protocol varies with the how uh, the patient responds to the treatment. So, you mm. first stabilize the patient. And mm. then, uh, we do, uh, like, how far they recover from the surgical uh, stress mm. itself. Mm. So, once uh, they are... Uh, we, uh, otherwise, we uh, turn the patient in bed, although the acute phase uh, rehabilitation goes on. Mm. And then, as far as the mobilization is concerned, I think uh, it takes roughly around... Uh, more than uh, 10 days, I should say, on an average. Mm -hmm. And after that, we try to mobilize them out of bed. Mm -hmm. we okay. just They first make them, uh, mobilize them on the bed, make them sit up, and mm -hmm. then uh, mobilizing them out of the bed at least takes 10 days on an average okay. for us. Okay. Because uh, in Nottingham and in uh, Sheffield, we used to, two weeks is a, is a complete flat rest. Then they went to one week. and But obviously, they used to do six weeks. Uh, I'm not sure whether it has changed now, but uh, it used to be six weeks uh, flat rest in acute uh, traumatic uh, spinal cord injury. And uh, mm -hmm. then they mobilized them on the wheelchair. And that's what I, I want to know. Uh, oh, our, is it the same with the surgery, surgically but, manager also? Please. But, but Murali, you must remember one thing. Hospice free never did surgery at all. Ah, yeah, that's, that's, that's not, not yeah. Surgery, surgery stabilization is not. Surgical stabilization is not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the protocol which we had in Stanmore, which we are also trying to incorporate into whatever little spinal injury we have in Ramchandra, is that we try to get them up and about on the third or the fourth day if you are operating on them. Mm. So the third or fourth day, they are made to sit bed, uh, by in, in, in bed mobilization. Mm. And then the physios take over after that for a week or so for, uh, you know, the striker bed mobilization and standing posture, etc. 
So beyond that, beyond two weeks, we lose contact with them because we don't have a rehab center attached with us. Okay. They go over to KK Nagar or to CMC Velour. Mm. I think uh, we'll move on, sir. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I think uh, then uh, now it's going to be very interesting uh, part. Now I, let me hand over to. I think are we starting with the rehabilitation of a paraplegic patient? Is Henry going to take over or uh, Vengadesh? Yes, is sir. Doctor Henry. Doctor Henry. Okay, Henry, you take over now. Rehabilitation of the paraplegic patient. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. My audible. Yeah. Good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me over. Um, I think Professor Nalli has almost covered uh, almost most of it, probably because we do see a lot of acute, subacute, and chronic uh, in our institute. Um, when I was talking to our spinal surgeons here, uh, they said, uh, "Boss, you need to talk what happens after suture removal." Uh, because my worry is till the sutures are removed. After that, I don't usually follow this patient up. So I thought, let me call this as beyond suture removal. And uh, I have been fortunate enough to uh, work in Madras Medical College. I was in KK Nagar. Uh, so I have seen what goes on there. And I have been in CMC for the last 18 years. And I have also been in Sheffield for three years where I worked in the spine injuries unit. So uh, I I can share and I can discuss uh, things which I learned there in KK Nagar, I learned in Sheffield and what we practice here in CMC Bello. Um, I was told there will be some fellows and students. Uh, I don't think I see too many, but uh, let me start with uh, spinal cord injury rehab actually became famous uh, in Europe, but uh, across the globe, people uh, like uh, Donald Munro, who made it famous in the Americas. Uh, Gutman made it big in uh, UK. Uh, and of course, Mary Vergis uh, made it really big in uh, the Eastern side of it. And of course, Australia bedrock uh, did a lot of job. Uh, Mary Vergis, uh, uh, you have to uh, understand that she is an alumnus of uh, CMC Velo who had an accident, who became a paraplegic. And uh, after paraplegia, she did not give up. I think she was doing internship when she had her trauma. After that, she did go to America. She did go to UK. She did go to Australia, trained in all these three places, gathered a lot of information and came back. And in 1962, she started uh, our center, which is called the Mary Burgess Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, right now, our strength is about 100 beds. And we do take care of both acquired brain injury and spinal cord injury. And uh, most of our patients are uh, subacute and chronic patients. And once in a while, we do take over patients early from the spine surgeons, uh, from uh, the spine surgery and the neurosurgery uh, department. So that's the institute where we take care of most of these people. Um, uh, one of the main, uh, things which uh, people should know is the classification. We started with Frankel long ago, and Frankel's classification was then converted to uh, the Asia classification and uh, the beauty of the Asia classification is that this examination can be done in supine position without moving his head or neck and all the key muscles and the key dermatomes can be examined in that supine position. The idea of this uh, scale or score was that you do this uh, as soon as after uh, in the casualty or within 24 hours of injury then you kind of follow them up in one month's time, three months' time, six months' time, and one year's time. And you compare it and see how much of recovery has happened. And this score has helped us to kind of do research in multiple centers, uh, compare our notes with what they are doing in the West and how we examine and see the recovery patterns uh, in spinal cord injury. Now, there is a lot of work done by Bracken et al. and uh, uh, people looking at conversion rates. But then again, it all depends on how early the patient is extricated, how he's extricated from his uh, trauma site, and of course, how much of uh, um, uh, transport injury, secondary injury, how early the surgeries are done, what kind of uh, care he gets, 
all matters to the conversion from Asia A to Asia E. Now, um, the International Spinal Cord Society has been making some adjustments and improvements to this uh, scoring. Last one that was edited and uh, new uh, elements were included was in 2019. You can look up uh, the new editions in Asia score. So basically, key motor points can be uh, tested in supine position without log rolling him or turning him around. Key dermatomes can be tested. And the last normal uh, sensory segment is noted down. And the last uh, motor segment, which has grade three power, provided the uh, one which is rostral is normal, is noted down as a sensory level. Now, um, interestingly, a um, uh, lot of research has uh, gone on with disability injury where people have looked at uh, the ROS model of how they kind of uh, uh, come from anger to denial to depression to recovery. But probably in the last 20 years, uh, what I have seen and uh, what I have noted in the patients in India, and um, of course my colleagues will share their experience after my talk, uh, is that uh, I think this uh, model of recovery, uh, psychological recovery after spinal cord injury has been overstated. Uh, people have actually taken advantage of that and thought patients are denying, patients are depressed. But uh, to be very frank, practically, we don't really see so much of depression in our country, in our society, in our culture, compared to probably what we see in the West. Um, and I think if patients are referred early, if patients are admitted early to a rehab unit, wherever it is, and they are handheld properly, I don't think they go into severe depression. I don't think they will need professional help, and I don't think they need medication. So. Um, this is a theoretical model which was actually designed and devised for cancer patients of how they go through uh, anger, denial, depression. But uh, I think if we up the uh, speed of referral to good rehabilitation centers, I think people will be able to uh, handle their uh, problems well. And I'm, I'm sure that our population is much more resilient and uh, after spinal cord injury, once they start a little bit of uh, acceptance, they, they become really strong. So this is one of the patients uh, recently who came to us. Uh, I mean, the moment we saw these uh, x-rays, we always were wondering, how are we going to manage his pain? He's going to be very difficult to manage. How are we going to mobilize him? Uh, but, but you uh, look at him within uh, six weeks to eight weeks of rehab, is sitting comfortably in the wheelchair. He hardly had any neuropathic uh, pain after that. And he was kind of independent on the wheelchair. Now, uh, uh, Professor Nali has already mentioned uh, certain complications. I would like to just add on what different uh, innovations we have had and what differently we do. Um, starting with pressure saw, we do see a lot of pressure saws and the uh, classification for pressure saw, which is usually followed is a National Pressure Ulcer Association classification. Um, uh, when I was in Sheffield, uh, there were special beds called uh, air flotation beds. They are very expensive. Even the NHS is unable to... Um, there's a little bit of feedback. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, hello. Uh, can, can you ask the host? Somebody is... Can you mute everyone? No. Thank you. Mute all the uh, participants here. May I go ahead? I don't the name there. Just put support alone. I think that is the, that's where the disturbance is from. So Chandra Ketu, can you just uh, ask? Uh, yeah. Mute everyone. Mute everyone. Yeah, can I go ahead? Am I audible? Yes, I Yeah. So, uh, Professor Nali was telling about pressure source. We do see a lot of pressure source. Um, it happens because there is no sensation, there's no feedback, and beyond 33 mm of pressure compresses the capillaries and damages the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and the muscle. Uh, mind you, one of the most sensitive 
organs, organelles to pressure is uh, the muscle. Usually the muscle breaks down much earlier than what we see in the skin. And uh, it takes a big toll on the patient's time and money. Um, sorting out a pressure saw, a grade four pressure saw, whether it's sacral or trochanteric takes about uh, two months because we need to get them lying prone, then operate and then keep prone till suture removal and then mobilize. And it's a waste of money. So if we can avoid and prevent pressure sores, that's a big, big advantage for the patients. Now, like I said, even in NHS, uh, they do use uh, air flotation beds, which the NHS also doesn't own. It is leased out by the company uh, and they pay about 150 pounds a night, apparently to keep a bed or use a bed. So when I was in uh, uh, rounds there, somebody uh, showed me that bed and one of the consultants said, uh, I'm sure you cannot afford this, what you do in India. So um, I thought this is an overkill, we don't need air flotation. So one of the simplest things which we do here is uh, ask the patient to lie prone. And, is, and most of the patients have a trochanteric ulcer or a sacral ulcer. And we know it's a pressure so You put anything on it, it's not going to heal. You have to take away the pressure and it will heal. So we have devised a simple solution called the split mattress, where you basically put the patient, you take mattress and divide it into blocks and put gaps. So there's a gap for the catheter, there's a gap for the stomach area, and there could be a gap for the trochanter. And worst case scenario, if the patient is unable to tolerate prone, you can put him supine and his ulcers will be in the gap. So there's no direct pressure on the ulcer. So this has been a very successful method. It, yeah, pressure sores heal beautifully. And uh, the other thing uh, which I want to bring uh, uh, in front here is that there's a lot of uh, uh, chemicals and solutions and dressing materials available in the market. But again, I think if the pressure saw is debrided chemically or surgically in the initial stages, if it requires a debridement, after that, if there's red granulation tissue, the best dressing material which we have found works is saline, normal saline dressing twice daily, the wound is large. If the wound is small, single uh, dressing is also more than enough. So we always have only used normal saline. If there is debridement and there's a deep pocket of pus, of course, we do use diluted hydrogen peroxide and, and Dakin's or use all solution, which helps a little bit in chemical debridement. So uh, we have had great success with saline dressings. The other interesting uh, innovation which has happened here is that picture down there, a lady on a trolley. Um, if there's a large sacral or a trochanteric pressure saw, uh, you don't have to waste time lying in bed and waiting for that to be sorted out. What we tend to do is put them on this trolley and they can wheel themselves into therapy area, wheel themselves back to the bed and they stay prone and they can go out uh, of the building also and uh, spend time in the evening with the others on this. So these two innovations have really helped us a lot and the patients do get used to lying prone within a couple of days and if required, they do lie prone 24 seven eating, drinking, cleaning, everything happens prone with a little bit of uh, uh, turning in and around if they want. And somehow the anterior segment of the body never develops pressure source. Rarely in an emaciated patient, you can have an ASIS breakdown or a patella breakdown. Otherwise, you usually don't see breakdown in skin. So these two things, even when people from abroad come and see here, uh, they do take a lot of pictures of this uh, to have people and spine surgeons who come. Uh, they are really thrilled by looking at these two simple devices and they kind of wonder why are we wasting so much money back home. So, um, uh, pressure so again, um, uh, before going on to the next uh, bit, uh, uh, one of the good things in CMC Velour is uh, we uh, train our registrars and the staff here is able to give all care under one umbrella. What I mean by that is once the patient is referred to PMR or physical medicine and rehabilitation, we are able to take care of most of his uh, complications, whether it is subacute uh, or chronic or even acute. Um, so uh, our training involves uh, training uh, for surgically managing the pressure source. So um, I am able to close most of the brick grade four pressure source trochanteric with TFL flap, uh, sacral with the gluteal rotation flap. These two are the most common and scale most of the time we do direct closures and if required a hamstring flap or if required a sensory flap. So um, 
uh, how this helps uh, patient does not have to be shunted from one place to the other place uh, the cost is kept low and the rehab nurse who looks after these patients understands uh, all bits of rehab all bits of spinal cord injury all bits of tetraplegias needs and paraplegias needs and uh, she takes care of them well if it's a plastic surgery ward those nurses are only um, good at looking after non neuropathic patients as when there's a paraplegic or a tetraplegic they they struggle to look after the other needs so um, we are able to do most of our pressure so work in fact if the pressure there is a patient with the pressure so and unfortunately or by mistake he goes to plastic surgery they send them straight to our own department and say you take care of it and uh, by the time we shut down the pressure so we get time to uh, know the patient build a rapport with the patient he gets comfortable with us finances are kept low and we have very good success with this model so uh, urology work pressure so work um, basic medical work everything is done inside the department very rarely do we have to um, uh, kind of uh, refer these patients uh, for uh, specialist departments of course when there's a big problem we do uh, but i will tell you the urology bit uh, which we are able to do in our own department sorry this um so um uh, coming to uh, mobility uh, again there was a question about uh, uh, when do we mobilize them how do we mobilize them some mobilize early some mobilize after a two week period some mobilize with a brace so apparently it all depends on the surgeon and the kind of uh, situation he has been through the bone stock which he has seen the fixation he has done so there are surgeons who would like to mobilize the patients early there are some if it's a large implant say okay no keep a brace as you mobilize him and slowly take it off and but i think what we have seen here from our spine surgeons is by the time they come to us after suture removal is about a week or 10 days and after that uh, if the surgeon says we keep a brace otherwise without the brace we do mobilize them gradually and of course if there's a lot of pain we do um, uh, kind of uh, use a brace or go on the mobilization slowly um so um, mobilization again is bringing them to vertical position um, you do see those complications uh, orthostatic hypotension uh, which uh, professor nalli has already mentioned i will in the next few slides mention what the evidence based treatments for these things are and once a patient is able to kind of uh, do some strengthening exercises we progress the paraplegics to the parallel bar from the parallel bar to the walker and then to uh, kfos and uh, crutches now in the west we do not see anybody walking like this everybody uses a wheelchair probably because uh, the environment is friendly and these are not safe techniques so nobody makes paraplegics walk unless until they have hip flexors working or one side knee extensors working i have not seen anybody walk there probably cord equinas or some uh, peripheral nerve injury people walk with some calipers otherwise most of them are now wheelchair now the impetus to walking with bilateral kfos has come from uh, the days of uh, mary workis one of the reasons was uh, back then uh, the environment was not friendly none of the environment was it actually friendly for a wheelchair in the last couple of two decades i think lots has changed and of course uh, there is not a single patient who does not want to walk whatever level he is one of the first questions the patients ask uh, when am i going to walk they don't even ask whether my bladder is going to become normal the question is when am i when will i walk and then only the other questions of will my bladder come back will my bowel control come back sexual sexuality come back and all those things everybody is desperate to walk um what we have done is we do uh, make people Uh, stand and try walking if they are lightweight strong in the upper limbs and if their lower abdominals are working well both upper and lower abdominals and the quadriceps lumborum l1 some supply is there they are able to kind of walk with bilateral kfos and crutches and even if they are able to walk for a couple of steps i think it's good enough because at home when they go back they can wear the calipers stand up and walk go out uh, of their house and maybe then transfer on to a tricycle or a tri wheeler and then travel whatever distances they can now there has been a rare patient who without the lower abdominals just with the upper abdominals 
uh, strength and immense upper limb strength has uh, walked. There are some of uh, the patients who are still walking like that, but that's rare. We've seen about only 15% of people uh, who are T12, uh, between T8 and uh, T12 continue to walk after uh, rehabilitation. Now, when I was, uh, I'll just go back to a little bit of uh, acute phase uh, uh, evidence. Um, one of the surgeons told me that uh, probably there'll be students, you should mention something about neuroprotection. Um, uh, surgery is there. I think uh, surgery is uh, helping in decompression and in stabilizing the spine. Um, there's a lot of talk on secondary injury and neuroprotection. And uh, the famous uh, three NASA studies uh, done by Bracken et al., 84, 90s, uh, and 97. Uh, the first study, the second study, and the third study, the numbers became big. But uh, later in uh, 98 and in 2000, people went back, looked at those studies, and pointed at a lot of uh, analysis problem, a lot of randomization problems. And uh, they said that no, methylprednisolone really does not uh, help. So there's level 1A evidence to say that uh, in acute neurological, it does not help in neurological recovery. And there's significant uh, medical complications like urinary tract infection is the most common with uh, high dose methylprednisolone, which again causes a lot of morbidity and mortality. Now, there has been other medications uh, on the block which they have tried for uh, 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 recovery, uh, prevention of secondary damage, that is uh, the reactive species uh, uh, and uh, uh, free radical damage uh, caused to the spinal cord. Uh, there are some level of uh, evidences there, level 1A for naloxone, nemodipine, and triliza, level 1B for erythropoietin. Uh, erythropoietin has shown some promising uh, results. Uh, GM gangliosides are uh, not effective in neural recovery. And um, there is some, again, some promising results with uh, uh, granulocyte uh, quality stimulating uh, factors. There are some drugs which have been still uh, worked on in phase one and phase two trials. I think larger numbers need to be done to see how effective they will be. So they are the cetrin, the minoxicillin, and the relizol. I think somebody was speaking about uh, Riluzol. Uh, Riluzol again has shown, but still in level two. I think 2016 onwards, there is a large trial which is uh, going on. Um, I don't think the results are uh, out yet. Now, Dr. Nali had again mentioned this, uh, orthostatic hypertension, because there is no sympathetic tone. Uh, the blood vessels uh, kind of are dilated. All the blood pools down when you're vertical and uh, you end up having um, orthostatic hypotension. We have not seen people struggling with it for a long time, within four to five days, with slow tilting, with great bandaging, with electrical stimulation. Uh, they are uh, over the hill, and they are able to maintain, uh, uh, go onto a standing table for a couple of minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. But there is, uh, uh, there are a few patients who do struggle uh, for a long time. Um, again, uh, there is uh, some evidence about uh, treating this uh, uh, hypostatic or uh, hypotension, orthostatic hypotension with uh, midodrin. Midodrin is uh, got some level two uh, evidence now. Uh, we do use a lot of ephedrine, fludricortisone uh, rarely. Midodrin is now in, uh, available in uh, India. And uh, level one evidence is there for whole body uh, vibration. There are uh, techniques where in the standing and tilting table, you have uh, actuators and motors which vibrate and give a lot of proprioceptive input, which apparently does help in orthostatic hypotension. Uh, again, uh, autonomic uh, dysreflexia uh, has been mentioned again, T6 and above, you usually see it. And most of the times, once you educate the patient, they themselves are able to diagnose it and call for help. Most of the time, it's the patient who uh, says that, yeah, I'm going to have one. So the classical symptoms are extremely high blood pressure, uh, bradycardia, uh, uh, goose flesh, and injection of eyes, and above the level of lesion, there'll be a little more uh, redness, which is uh, seen more in lighter skin people. And what do you do? The first thing to do when you see somebody with autonomic dysreflexia is to make them sit up. Why are we doing this? So that you bring down uh, the pressure in the brain. The whole idea of um, uh, treating patients with AD is to prevent 
excessive intracranial pressure, which can cause a hemorrhage inside the brain. So the first thing always, always is to make the patient vertical or sit up in bed. As soon as the patient has sat up, if the pressure is very high, he can be given nitroglycerin sprays, which is usually used in the West. We do give uh, nifedipine. Um, and after the patient has been sat up, you have to look for nociceptive stimuli. Most commonly is a nociceptive stimuli below the level of lesion, which actually radiates the spinal cord with signals and causes uh, intense sympathetic uh, uh, outflow, which causes all this planconic blood vessels to contract and uh, the blood pressure goes up. And uh, to counter that, uh, the carotid body senses it and drops the heart rate. So. Uh, um, uh, that's uh, that's the uh, mechanism for uh, autonomic uh, dysreflex here. Um, like I said, uh, there is some level one evidence for prazosine. If the patient is regularly getting autonomic dysreflex here, a few can, especially if we, they have an undiagnosed bladder stone or undiagnosed bladder issues. Um, most of the superficial things you'll be able to pick up like a preso or a ingrowing toenail or a tight clothing like he had mentioned. But uh, sometimes it's a bladder most commonly, which gives a problem. Uh, we have seen patients who have severely small contracted bladder with an indwelling catheter, which the catheter irritation itself uh, leads on to a lot of autonomic dysreflexias. So prazosin has level one evidence for prophylaxis of AD. And of course, I mentioned nifedipine and nitroglycerin spray can be used. And uh, the thing is to make sure that you don't drop the pr blood pressure aggressively because they can end up with a stroke and you will have a double whammy of spinal cord injury and stroke. So uh, it has to be done very uh, gradually. Um, neurovesicle dysfunction, again, it's a big topic. It's a class by uh, uh, itself. Um, the most common cause for mortality uh, in the uh, uh, early 50s and 60s was urinary tract infection, sepsis, uh, and death. And then the pressure so was the second common cause of uh, death. But with the advent of uh, newer catheters uh, and the understanding of why this infection happens and why it kills the patient and the patient goes into sepsis uh, came out in 1970. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting uh, story where uh, actually um, intermittent catheterization uh, uh, was actually started by Cutman in the 1950s, and it was a sterile intermittent catheterization. So every time the catheter was sterilized and uh, catheterization was done. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, uh, the whole scenario changed when there was a publication, it was in 1971, when they said, you do not have to use sterile catheters, you can use a clean catheter and reuse the catheter. And uh, when this publication came from Brazil, all the urologists were kind of up and against and said, this is rubbish, this is not possible, this is wrong. Uh, how this uh, came into picture was because of a patient. A patient was uh, doing intermittent catheterization with sterile technique and she was traveling and a catheter fell down in the airport. She didn't have an extra catheter. She just washed the catheter and started doing ICC. And from then on, she used the same catheter. She didn't uh, you sterilize it or take a new one. And when she went back and told her urologist that she's been doing this, they started looking at this and they found out that you can use clean techniques. You can reuse the catheter. In our institute, patients, once they go into the community, are using, reusing the same police catheter for probably a month also without any infections. And we hardly see infections once the patient is on intermittent clean catheters. Now, the philosophy behind why the bladder doesn't get into trouble with uh, intermittent catheterization is that uh, uh, you are drinking limited amount of fluid, you are doing intermittent catheterization every four to six hours, and you are emptying the bladder. So emptying the bladder and preventing it from going into this uh, distension is what prevents UTIs. So one of the first level of protection in the bladder is the mucosal level. And... Uh, when somebody is on intermittent catheterization, his bladder is not let to distend more than 200 to 300 ml because he's restricting fluid intake and he's doing it every four to six hours. So that itself prevents bladder distension. So once the bladder gets distended for some reason, the first level of uh, protection is broken down, the mucosal uh, level uh, breaks down and uh, uh, bugs enter the uh, system. 
um, people with intermittent catheterization have always got bugs in the urine but because they are regularly taking them out every 3 to 4 hours or 4 to 6 hours uh, we don't get such a big load of bugs and they are not breaking into the mucosal uh, layer so what do we do uh, uh, convert them uh, if they have good hand function to intermittent catheterization as soon as they are able to sit and uh, locate uh, the genitalia and are able to do it how do we follow up uh, their renal function of course uh, for the surgeon in the acute phase you can look at serum creatinine and ultrasound kub um, etc but by the time the patient becomes subacute and chronic he is uh, especially in complete cord lesions he has lost a lot of muscle mass and doing serum creatinine does not make any sense because you take a chronic paraplegic and do serum creatinine it will be much lower than your lab values because there's no muscle mass to give that load of creatinine so you won't pick up a renal failure if at all you will pick it up when the cities have really failed so what needs to be kept in mind is in somebody who has already had wasting of his muscles you have to do a 24 hour serum rather than a single creatinine and of course you need to do ultrasounds to make sure that there is no uh, reflux changes in the uh, uh, kidney and the kidney is safe so at the end of the day the moral of the story is you have to keep the kidney safe there should not be any bract pressures and the bladder uh, to be maintained for social continence he should be able to be without a catheter or be dry for at least 4 to 6 hours so that he can be socially continent and mix around then other complications are there which we won't go into the other common complications which we see are uh, uh, bladder stones and we are able to uh, remove small stones with the scope and the rest of it i use the bigger ones to get out for random and put an spc um we do our own cystometrograms we do a water cystometry if the patient is having a lot of leaks with intermittent catheterization we do uh, only i think morally uh, yeah, i think the distance from the water Yourself, yes. Yeah. Yes. Proceed. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if the patient is not socially continent between intermittent catheterization, if he is regularly having UTIs, if he is regularly leaking, then there is an indication for a cystometrogram, which we do it in our own department again to see what kind of bladder he has and uh, what kind of pressures he is developing. So. he might not be leaking but if in case he has very high pressure bladders and he is already showing some kidney changes his kidneys can get damaged now there's something new which we are doing uh, it's called the serum cystatin again serum cystatin is a protein uh, which is uh, uh, there in our bodies and it's a good uh, indicator of renal function a single uh, we have done a study it's uh, going for publication now so um 24 hour serum creatinine clearance is again easy and cheap but it's you have to collect 24 hour urine it should be accurate volumes and stuff like that whereas serum cystatin is a single one point blood test which will tell you uh, the renal function because cystatin like creatinine gets cleared by the kidney but it is not muscle mass dependent so we have started doing serum cystatin for our chronic patients like i said um the cystometrogram will give us a picture uh, as to what the bladder pressures are and what volume is but for the basic understanding of the bladder um this is known as the madder splashes classification where the depending on the neurological level or neurological insult you can have one of these patterns but for somebody who needs to be socially continent and who needs to be uh, safe on the kidneys what we need to have is number 2 where we need to have a close sphincter and a loose bladder wall so there is something called ditrisa sphincter dysenergia in some patients the bladder and the sphincter contracts at the same time so what happens is no urine comes out all the urine back flows to the kidney and the kidney can get damaged so uh that again if you want to prove it you will have to do a cystometrogram or a, uh, a dynamic a urodynamic uh, study to prove that both the sphincter and the bladder is contracting and there is a reflux onto the kidneys so number 2 is what we are aiming for with the uh, interventions uh, which we uh, usually give now again uh, professor had mentioned uh, the medications anticholinergics um oxybutynin is the most common one uh, which is required for somebody who has a spastic bladder and he is not uh, socially continent between 4 to 6 hours of 
um, uh, uh, intermittent catheterization. So that's a list of uh, anticholinergic. Uh, something new is Mirabegron. Mirabegron is a beta-3 adrenergic antagonist. It's in the market. I think some of the urologists are using it. Um, it's expensive in India. It's about 40 rupees a tablet. Works well. But uh, long-term safety is still uh, pending. Uh, there are some reports of uh, early dementia in elderly people. So um, that's something uh, new in the market. It's available in India. Neurotoxin, again, uh, works brilliantly. If somebody does not want to take anticholinergic and he has a very small spastic bladder, uh, uh, neurotoxin, intravesical neurotoxin can be injected through a scope. And uh, it works well for about four to six months. And of course, it has to be repeated. Uh, depending on the size of the patient, 200 to 300 units is required. Um, I have done a couple of injections uh, uh, for spinal cord injury patients here, but then the problem is uh, the cost. Um, each 100 units is about 17,000, so um, one treatment itself will be about 50,000 rupees, so not many takers for that, but it works beautifully. In the NHS, it's uh, free, so people who get these come back every four to six months and uh, get it injected and it uh, works uh, quite well. Of course, they need to continue ICC. It's not that they're going to be continent after neurotoxin. It just paralyzes the bladder a little bit, gives them more volume and prevents back pressure to the kidney. Uh, bone health, again, a uh, uh, big topic nowadays uh, uh, in the non-neuropaths, but uh, we have also been struggling to look at uh, the number of fractures which uh, uh, paraplegics and tetraplegics suffer after they go back to the community. Again, not very strong evidence as of now. We've had some uh, research work uh, done with Zolindronet, and we do give uh, for uh, diagnosed patients. And uh, that's uh, some evidence for these drugs. Uh, uh, Alendronate uh, and Zolindronate is what we have used. We have not really used uh, Tildronate and Pamidronate. Um, for tetraplegics, again, uh, something new, uh, which uh, we have started, again, uh, not frequently done. Uh, it's a very complex procedure. I have done two cases with uh, the help of the hand surgeons here. Um, this was actually invented by a surgeon called Jan Frieden from Sweden. And uh, so C6 level tetraplegics have, uh, C5 is uh, biceps, C6 is wrist extensors. So they stop with that. They don't have uh, C7, they don't have elbow extensors, and they don't have finger uh, extensors and uh, flexors. So this particular procedure is a multiple tendon transfer uh, procedure, which helps motorize uh, the uh, paralyzed uh, uh, segment. So basically, you do a split FPL to EPL, uh, flexor pollicis longer to extensor pollicis longer to, for the distal thumb tenodesis. Then you kind of passively uh, construct the introsia for this uh, lumbrical position. And then you kind of arthrodesis the uh, CMC joint. The brachioradialis is sent and connected to the FPL so that when the person actually flexes, the FPL comes and jams against the forefinger. And the ECRL for the FDP to give them. Uh, so in C6, all these muscles are working, the brachioradialis, ECRL. Uh, and EPL, um, uh, and you kind of motorize the paralyzed uh, uh, segment so that these tetraplegics are able to grip and grasp to a certain extent, to a certain amount of weight. So they're able to write uh, with the shoulder and elbow gripper pen. They're able to grip a stool without any orthosis at all. And people have gone ahead uh, uh, being more comfortable with wheeling their chair and painting. Again, it's a long uh, process and long surgery. This surgery took about eight hours. So not many takers again, because everyone hopes they will recover. So they do not want any surgical intervention um, even after a chronic uh, phase. Now, uh, there are a lot of other things which I can go, uh, uh, but uh, I don't know how much time I have. I will quickly uh, wrap up and then start discussions uh, and take on some questions. So uh, one of the strength uh, is our follow-up patients. We are able to follow our patients very well. Uh, uh, we do follow up our spinal cord injury patients within 100 kilometer radius uh, almost every month. And we go sector by sector and see how they are doing, what they are doing, and uh, handhold them a bit for both medical, social, and uh, other economic uh, issues. We have a strong social work uh, team and uh, OTPT team, and we go as a team. and. 
we have about 700 patients in our books uh, who are within a 100 kilometer radius and we are able to follow them up very well. So we go to each area in a month and uh, we have something called the rehab mail up, which happens in uh, end of January, February. We try and invite as many patients to come and stay with us for three days. It is basically to handhold each other. The, these are all rehabilitated patients. They are doing well in the community. They do come for a quick medical checkup and then they spend uh, time in the next two days uh, uh, discussing their issues, uh, whatever legal issues, economic issues. A lot of classes are taken. They have sports. And we've been trying to push a lot of sporting activity, which my colleagues will uh, uh, start talking with. Now, if you look at the mortality uh, in spinal cord injury uh, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, after the World War II was uh, really bad, um, people died very early. In fact, um, if you look at the Egyptian scrolls, it says spinal cord injury is a disease which should not be treated because that was uh, so bad, the mortality rates were. So, uh, but uh, right from the 50s, 60s, and intermittent catheterizations, good precious OK has actually helped them. And we wanted to actually look at uh, how our patients are doing. So we kind of looked at about 30 years data and followed within 100 kilometer radius and saw how uh, they were doing. And uh, we actually looked at uh, their survival and we found that um, their 20 years, 60% of our patients uh, were surviving well up to 20 years. So five-year survival rate of CMC followed patients is uh, 86%. Uh, 15 uh, years is for 71% of the patients are surviving. And 25 years, 58% are surviving. And uh, that's data from Bangladesh. So definitely we are much better. And that's the data from uh, Western countries, uh, UK, US, where a lot of hand holding and uh, is done by the government and all the expenses are borne, whereas our patients all bear their own expense. So we are not bad. Uh, among the followed up patients, 20 year survival rate ours is about 63 and in the Western countries is about 70 to 86 and our average lifespan is about 68 right now. So that's pretty good statistics, I think. And this has been published in the archives of PM. Probably uh, this good result is because of uh, close follow up education. I still strongly believe that when the patient gets admitted in rehab institute here, it's not the medical people who make a big difference. Therapists do make a big difference, but the amount of classes we give them, we have group classes, we teach them about skin, pressure sores, bladder complications, infections, autonomic dysreflexia. So by the time the patient leaves us, he knows everything, the theory bit of it and little practical management also. Education is a key thing which they get here and they once they understand it, they never get into trouble. So probably that's why uh, these figures look good. So probably I'll stop with this and I'm happy to take questions and I will introduce uh, um, Justin and uh, YD to uh, be there and uh, take some questions. Justin is a C6 uh, tetraplegia and YD is a T8 paraplegia. And uh, those are uh, people who have, uh, I personally think, done much more than what I have done in this field. Yeah. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a great lecture, uh, Henry. I think before we go to the, uh, 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 the uh, next part of the program, uh, like I would like to have uh, pass a few comments here now. See, yeah. as you said, like the uh, Western countries, they yeah. uh, they are happy with the wheelchair being wheelchair bound. Yes. They, whereas uh, in our country, we attempt to mobilize this patient, make them walk as much as possible. Yes. And even we are not able to do that, we uh, uh, make them bound to wheelchairs. The reason being that the barrier-free environment is not there in our country. Right. Like I had right. visited uh, uh, in uh, Australia, Sydney. See, wherever you go, the, all the payments are barrier free. Anyone can just move around the country, wherever you go, which part, whichever part of the country you can go, it's barrier free. I think that is one factor which is uh, uh, the reason why they are happy being wheelchair bound. In fact, there are uh, paraplegics who, uh, who work as uh, volunteers and they visit homes and then they uh, help in the rehabilitation of these uh, uh, spinal injury victims. 
think that is one reason why like we are more insisting on uh, making these patients walk rather than uh, making them yeah. that's one yeah. thing number two is regarding your uh, very interesting uh, observation on the uh, uh, bladder catheterization the intermittent catheterization so at this point i would like to say is one another factor why uh, it's the uh, use uh, is enough that we use a clean catheter rather than a sterile i mean uh, sterile catheter the reason is I, I, at this moment, I remember uh, Professor D.K. Shannuk Sundaram was a pioneer in the management of the spinal injury. So th these were the uh, explanations given by Professor D.K. Shannuk Sundaram himself when we raised this question. He says that the uh, reason why these people do not develop uh, urinary infection is that there occurs some uh, modifications in the epithelial lining of this bladder. I think the studies have gone and then that is the reason why they become resistant to infection. So that may be one reason. Like your reasons, one is the uh, the bladder distension is not there. But one another reason which what is being cited uh, according to the words of Professor is that the epithelial modification, the lining epithelium of the uh, bladder goes for modification and then they become resistant to infection. So that is one reason why these people do not get infection. And now coming to the question, I want to ask you. We see that um, it's very difficult. Uh, like we have just in uh, tetraplegic, you as you said. Uh, it's very difficult to mobilizing the tetraplegics. So uh, can you just uh, throw us some light on how you do that? Uh, do you all have the same uh, problem like mobilizing them out of bed early? Um, like I said, uh, I think the most common thing, uh, what they face is orthostatic hypotension. But then at the end of the day, a tetraplegic is not going to stand and walk. So if we achieve sitting, that's more than uh, enough. So if they are struggling with op orthostatic hypotension, then we kind of assist them with some crepe bandages, abdominal binder, and slowly get them to it. And if required, some medications, which I had said, which has some evidence. But then what I have seen in the last uh, 18, 20 years is we've hardly struggled with someone beyond two weeks or something, and he's still struggling to sit and he's having a lot of hypotension. No, no. most of them are able to. Within a week or 10 days, they're able to sit up on their wheelchair do a high sitting and comfortably sit for a couple of hours instead. So more than that, uh, the uh, stabilization is fine. No, like how are they? Are you using braces for them? No. So again, uh, after spine surgery, if the surgeon says, yeah, keep the collar for some time, we do follow that depending on what the surgeon says. But if the soft tissues have healed and if there's no pain, we hardly keep uh, the collar after that. Beyond four to six weeks, no. Yes. If it's a very old patient, very osteoporotic, probably uh, incomplete and showing a lot of neurological recovery, probably we won't want to take a chance. But if it's Asia A and B where there's significant neurological insult already, fixation is good and the surgeon says, no problem, go ahead. We go ahead and mobilize them. We've not had major problems with that. I think Justin has had surgical fixation and he will be uh, able to tell you, uh, did you have a problem? Justin? So, yeah, hi, Doctor. Good evening, uh, all of you. Uh, yeah, so the initial uh, uh, couple of months, I had a lot of uh, postural hypotension. Uh, could not uh, sit. Uh, I don't know. Probably it was just me or uh, you know everybody else at my level. But uh, I did have a postural hypotension. I know probably Doctor Henry will not approve of this, but one of the techniques that uh, some of uh, people with spinal cord injury and uh, some of the hospitals also follow is uh, clamping of the catheter uh, for a limited time uh, after understanding the water intake. That increases uh, uh, the blood pressure slightly and you'll be able to effectively sit uh, and move around. Yeah, so that's basically creating an autonomic dysreflexia kind of a picture. And uh, following, so they do uh, do a lot of this in sports. So I think Justin will tell you more. So when it comes to competition, people kind of boost themselves with yeah. create a, hype, uh, a kind of a autonomic dysreflexia to improve performance. So people do do that. But we don't struggle with hypotension quite uh, quite often. Uh, Dr. Henry, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I think one of the difficult things that uh, we find is uh, how to break the news to the patient when 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 would you think is the right time and how to do that in in a way that they they do not become uh, too hopeless and dejected and depressed or at the same time tell them the truth and yeah. make them realize the reality i mean it's something i find difficult yeah. so uh, that's i think uh, everybody's uh, uh, 
difficulty um i struggled with that initially quite a lot and uh, uh, was i was told was uh, even mary vergis after 30 years of being a paraplegic she started this institution she was doing emgs on the wheelchair she was operating with paul brand on the wheelchair she was doing all that so um, even after that uh, i believe she uh, hoped some day uh, walk so hope is something we can't really kill we can't say no to it but then to an educated patient we do bring science and say this is the statistics but then uh, what uh, i tend to do is see what level patient is what the background is how old the patient is and is he already struggling with some other issues and then uh, slowly uh, break in but uh, i believe uh, even if i don't break in or i don't say much they are very observant they are so if you come to rehab institute in the evening you will see all the patients together exchanging notes and discussing so there will be a chronic patient who is admitted for some other problem second time third time so they do exchange a lot of notes they see a lot uh, our patients don't talk much but i think uh, that process automatically does happen some of them keep repeating those questions um, uh, i am uh, in my uh, department uh, i do uh, tell them directly when they are asking me uh, i don't kind of beat around the bush too much if they are asia a uh, and they are more than 6 months since injury or more than 3 months since injury um, but for you all it might be a little more difficult because you are seeing them in the first two weeks of their injury and um, probably the only way to uh, uh, hand hold them is to give them a lot of hope at that time and says that it's too early to say i mean definitely first two weeks are too early whatever asia score it is things can change depending on how much of secondary damage things were there uh, on that point i would like to take vidis and uh, justin's perspective as to as a patient now what would they want if they were injured today or within 2 to 3 weeks what would they like here vidi yo unmute unmute yo unmute can you unmute yourself yeah good evening thanks a lot uh, uh, louder uh, uh, it so happened that i was very wired and i asked the doctor within 45 minutes of my x ray will i be in some wheel chair i didn't know that i have a spinal cord injury my acceptance level was very quick but in general i have also been a visiting peer counselor at cmc valor for seven years and at other places in general what the people ask me i always tell them up front because it is good to know like if you are going to break the news in a very slow manner uh you may go to alternative treatments you may still go to alternative treatments but it's very important to tell them that i i let, let, let us say i'm interacting with a person who sustained a spinal cord injury yesterday this is what i tell them i tell them there is no uh, there is no cure for spinal cord injury in the, anywhere in the world there is possibility of this in some only one person the one person can do it it is god so let us all pray and hope that you get stem cell treatment three please, please do not fall into any false treatments which will uh, drain you of all your money and uh, don't do that four till such time there is physical improvement by the grace of god Uh, at the good get good rehabilitation use whatever is good in your body and move forward in life so this is how i do take a rehabilitation setup if i were to put in dr henry shoes a person will come for rehabilitation maybe for two months or three months if he is going to break it in bits and pieces and the final break comes after one and a half months the person will get into a depressive mode after one and a half months and then the next second half of the rehabilitation will go waste it is always better to break it up front and so that they get a period of adjustment and observant observation based adjustments will also happen and at least the person will make use of uh, the last four, four to five weeks and move ahead in life if I, i can cite many many examples i've probably peer counsel maybe about 2000 plus persons at cmc valor and i can say many many people who have benefited from moving on uh it's very important to break and i think uh, it will be great if these fine surgeons also break it don't break their hope tell them with the grace of god that could there is a possibility of improvement it's a matter it's very important to steer them away from 
stuff such as stem cell, lipidural stimulation, flower therapy, what not, all kinds of nonsense that floats around and destroys them financially. And uh, I have a question for Henry. Henry, it might be good if you can tell us why uh, T6 and above, the general goal is uh, only wheelchair-based rehabilitation. Yeah, so basically, um, uh, abdominal muscles are required for you to sit up straight and do twisting and turning. So if you do not have good abdominal muscles, there's no question of standing and walking with calipers. So T10 um, and above, in my mind, the best thing they can do is wheelchair. T10 and below, if they have both upper abdominals and lower abdominals are working, they can give it a go at caliper walking. Caliper walking comes with a lot of uh, uh, stress, a lot of energy is required. You need to use your shoulder muscles and move. So it's not easy without any proprioception. We always think about uh, strength, sensory feedback, we don't think. So uh, we usually uh, follow that protocol. So um, uh, one thing which uh, we have recently uh, been very interested in is uh, doing the unthinkable with our trained people. And uh, uh, we have done uh, quite a few things, uh, both uh, Vaidhi and uh, Justin. Justin is uh, an ace swimmer. Um, Justin, uh, go ahead, Justin. I, I think you should be speaking. Um, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks. Abhi. I'll just probably take two minutes to give a holistic uh, view. Uh, than you know, uh, going by individual questions. Uh, so I'll probably start with the common language we all understand. Uh, I'm a C6 tetraplegic. Uh, you know, after a C6, uh, C7 uh, dislocation, cord compression, uh, HRB, motor complete, sensory incomplete, uh, on an indwelling catheter, RTA case, uh, and it's been uh, 10 years since. That's the common language. However, the uncommon uh, thing uh, about me is I'm not bedridden or confined uh, within four walls like any other tetraplegic. Uh, I swim and uh, rifle shoot competitively. I've represented India at the Asian Games World Championship. Um, I also beat surf, scuba dive, uh, drive a hand-operated car. Uh, yeah, my fingers still don't function. Uh, uh, I just build up uh, the car and the way of uh, device to get adapted it for myself. I travel the world uh, by myself. And uh, one thing this COVID uh, situation has taught me is that I can completely, absolutely live uh, independently without any assistance. Because for the first uh, six, seven weeks of COVID, uh, I was stuck by myself. My uh, family could not return back uh, uh, from where they had gone. Uh, right from rationing, cooking, uh, you know, washing vessels, cleaning up myself, uh, bowel management, bladder. So I also had, uh, you know, catheter, uh, catheter block. So I had to change the catheter, indwelling catheter. Uh, so uh, 10 years back, if you'd asked me if uh, all of this was possible, I, uh, not even my wildest dreams, because the biggest routine was to stare at the ceiling uh, as a quadriplegic, because as a quadriplegic at C6, that's what uh, we are expected to do. And uh, that's what we are told as well. Uh, there are no precedences, uh, but uh, you know, at the acute stage, uh, here is a peak view of uh, how a person with a spinal cord injury actually uh, envisions or visualizes thing, things. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty that hits the person, right? Uh, financially, they're get getting drained day by day uh, with uh, all the medical costs, healthcare costs because of the surgery and hospitalization. Uh, bowel not working uh, properly, bladder not working properly. There could be a possibility of a pressure sore. So they don't know where to start and how to, you know, kind of actually get around things. Uh, apart from the big news that, uh, you know, they have a spinal cord injury and they never be able to walk or do things the same way. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the news uh, was broken uh, the very first day uh, the surgeon came and said, and I uh, absolutely appreciate that. For me, it was very fortunate because uh, beyond asking why me, it also helped me concentrate uh, what next. Uh, but that said, um, and I've spoken to a lot of uh, people with spinal cord injury. Uh, the surgeon uh, who fixes that person first is like the gateway or uh, in, in many people's words, uh, they are like the gods. Uh, the words that they say, the words that they utter is listened to very keenly and carefully. Uh, so uh, a little direction, a little perspective, a little guidance uh, from this fraternity would uh, you know, be putting the folks with spinal cord injury uh, at, uh, for the rest of their life in the right path. Uh, because otherwise, a common denominator uh, kind of an approach. So beyond actually uh, breaking the news, what actually crushes the spirit and soul of the person for the rest of their life is using a common denominator approach that uh, for the rest of your life, 
you will be uh, uh, in a wheelchair. So what if I'm on a wheelchair? Uh, wheelchair uh, should not be construed as uh, being bound in a wheelchair. Rather, for me, wheelchair is the enabler. Without the wheelchair, I cannot move around. So technically uh, and functionally, wheelchair is actually an enabler for me uh, because I'm moving around and doing a lot of things. Of course, I tried a lot of uh, robotic uh, stuff and all that stuff, but I realized at one point, therapeutically, I may, I may be able to do all of that. But functionally, I may not be able to do it. So while hope is great, while I uh, keep that in my mind, uh, parallelly, I have to live my life. I can't be dependent. I can't, uh, you know, let uh, people around also get affected because a spinal cord injury is not for the person, but for the entire family. So as soon as people start realizing that, and in my opinion, and in my experience, empirical evidence uh, that I, what I've uh, been looking at, the first one or two years is when you can push the person to actually start becoming independent. After which they get into their comfort zones and uh, live out of their uh, parents or spouses' uh, uh, money. So uh, that's that's basically my thought. Can I can I ask one question to both uh, uh, Justin and uh, Hello, Vaidhi Nathan? How are you? Fine, sir. Very good. Yeah, I last received a message from you two months back. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember what message it was. I just received a message from you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See now, um, uh, I was talking about the um, Western race happy with being wheelchair bound, and then we insist more on uh, uh, like uh, making the patient to walk, to be on their feet. Like that is because of the barrier-free atmosphere, which is our environment that is available there. So, what is your experience? What What are the difficulties you're facing? Are you all facing this problem in India? I think there is some change. I think happening now. But uh, how far has we have we? Uh, uh, overcome this uh, problem of barrier-free environment? Uh, personally, I've been, uh, I've now lived wonderfully well for 30 plus years with spinal cord injury. Yeah. If you ask me the first 10 years in Chennai, there was uh, a van was unheard of. Yeah. And some slowly started coming in. And things are much better now. But the real change is in the minds and the approaches of the users. The number of users who actually want to walk is significantly reduced. Even large number of people who have been trained in walking in CMC Velour, when uh, they give up their walking after some time. Today, if you ask me to name uh, people who are using walking for functional purposes, I'll struggle to go uh, beyond 10. And I know maybe about 5,000 people minimum with spinal cord injury across the country. And in the last 10 years, uh, wheelchair-based activity, wheelchair-based life, we don't worry about steps. We either have skills or we uh, we know how to get one person to get the wheelchair up and down the steps. I have come down three floors of stairs with the help of just one person. And uh, yeah, young guys, they do steps on their own on the wheelchair. And for all of us, the ramp is not the accessibility. For all, I think this, this perception has changed across the country. For me, what way defines accessibility is if I suppose I come to your home, if your home has 10 steps, I won't worry about that. I'll get into your home. But if, you're, if the toilet in your home is not accessible, I, will, I cannot even spend maybe some meaningful time at your home. Okay. I think the toilet being accessible, an accessible toilet is just 40 square feet. That is what is the toilet at my home. Accessible toilet is what should define accessibility, not a ramp. And uh, where users are moving towards wheelchair-based lives, uh, I, the two, two examples I can give you, both of them used to 100% walk uh, uh, till maybe about five years ago. Today, they walk maybe only 2% of the time whenever they come to a bathroom or something where the wheelchair is not going. And wheelchairs are getting more compact and it will be good if all of us encourage people towards wheelchair-based life and otherwise they tend to uh, I remember Henry once told me, I wish the standing table and the tilting table were not there in India. The standing table and tilting table are, are, always gives people hope that they can stand, they can walk. So I think it's important to push people towards a wheelchair-based life. And that is where the user world is definitely going. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, uh, sir, uh, a wheelchair uh, can make a person more mobile than a crutch can. Honestly, more mobile and more active because it, it all happens fastly. You just transfer to the wheelchair and move around very fast. I can move around faster than you when you're walking, if you're walking. 
morning when i do my 2 uh, km run every day i do it faster than being a tetraplegic the only thing adaptation that i have is a uh, glove with additional grips uh, so that i use the you know uh, lower end of my palm to push i push it faster than a person who's actually walking next to me so ideally you know a wheelchair makes it fast and the fact that the wheelchairs uh, are becoming lighter and uh, you know it's very important uh, as you said in your presentation no one size fits all appropriate wheelchair for their size that is starting to happen customizable wheelchair for that person's uh, fit and they are getting light and active so your lifestyle actually changes for the better i have been in a wheelchair for the last 10 years first one and a half years on a motorized wheelchair i religiously and cautiously moved away from it and now i only push a wheelchair which is a manual wheelchair which fits my size and which is lighter in weight i used to walk for exercise purposes with the walker in california but i gave it up in 1995 oh. and i've never found anything uh uh amiss in my life and uh, i and today at 6 rupees 6500 there are good uh for we does it does of the wheelchairs available that make possible for good posture they may not be lightweight as justin says but they make for excellent posture in fact that 6500 the wheelchair has become our mass uh, recommended model now and there is something good at 15000 there is something great out of iit madras at about 35000 so the wheelchair landscape has changed the users mindset has changed okay Okay. Uh, that, that, that can is, I ask yeah. a question? That uh, can I? I should finish. Uh, finding one minute. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, I think this is uh, one um, uh, thing I learned from you know because we've been always insisting on barrier-free environment, barrier-free environment like that. But you insisted on uh, the provision of a, uh, a toilet uh, which can be used by you all. I think that's that is uh, uh, a point which we learned today. Uh, funny, yes. Carry on, uh, Doctor Henry. There are uh, some. Um... new technology is coming in like uh, bladder uh, stimulation with an you know implantable device uh, what is your uh, tip on those uh, for for bladder control yeah so i think bladder stimulation devices came in the 90s itself uh, 80s 90s itself the sacral anterior root stimulators mm. um, i mean i have seen couple of patients on it when i was in sheffield Uh, but then i think they went out of fashion very soon because the complication rates were very high they had to pull it out a lot of wires this and that a few patients which i saw as follow up in sheffield which were implanted long back um, they were using it only for the bowel bladder somehow uh, it didn't really make it big apparently there is some research uh, going on in oxford where they are looking at an array of electrodes which is very microscopic now that uh, that technology has uh, kind of miniaturized quite well i think there is some study or uh, some trial going on but as of now i don't think uh, that uh, technology is really uh, worth it there are people who have a very uh, uh, spastic bladder with an open neck they always end up in trouble because whether icc or not they even if you put a catheter or an spc they keep leaking because the neck is very patulous there i think an artificial urethral sphincter i have seen a lot of uh, patients uh, uh, the urologists used to regularly do it on uh, paraplegic patients there so they put an aus uh, and what do they do they just relax the aus do the icc and then they fill up again so that way they are socially continent so aus makes sense if you have an open bladder neck and you are constantly leaking uh, otherwise uh, sacral anterior root stimulators are out as of now they not being used but there is one uh, population that has been fraudulently uh, peddled i think uh, this is the epidural stimulation that is a research project by the again yeah that's that's research yeah that's research so yeah unfortunately there is a doctor and a hospital in delhi that is peddling this big time i had somebody inquire interact with them on my behalf he said 15 lakhs you come we will make uh, solve your in the problems you pay me another 16 lakhs we will uh, another 6 lakhs we will restore your bladder sensation and control uh, this is ibs hospitals dr sachin kandori so the spine foundation put out a detailed note on epidural stimulation and how it is a fraud and what is the enticement that he offers you there's a clinic in thailand that uh, is came uh, uh, this if you go to thailand it will cost you 50 lakhs i will do it at 15 lakhs so this is a kind of frauds that are happening we need to be very wary Uh, Dr. Henry, I, I just want to ask you about uh, how do you uh, manage the spasticity and uh, 
you know, severely spastic patients. And yeah. uh, what is the role of uh, these baclofen pumps do you, for implantable pumps again? Yeah. So again, spasticity is very variable. Uh, some patients have a lot of spasticity, some don't, some are able to manage with what uh, they have. And in some pa patients, it's helpful that spasticity helps them to do certain things like a transfer or standing or something. So if the spasticity is not letting you achieve uh, independent goals, uh, sitting on a wheelchair and stuff like that, then it requires treatment. So we usually play around with uh, medications. Uh, uh, baclofen and tizanidine is the most common one which we use. Uh, some people tend to use diazepam, it's cheaper, but long term, these are not good. Um, uh, we, in, if it's in Asia, a more than six months old injury, and you know that he's not going to really uh, walk again. There, I think you can do neurolysis, either with phenol, alcohol, or a neurectomy, and, or a motor endpoint, uh, wherever the nerve is going and going into the muscle, you can nip it up selective motor fasciculotomy that's called so those are very good procedures which kind of relieve you of uh, spasticity we do that for asia a and asia b whenever possible because it's cheap and one time worst case scenario a denotomy if he's convinced he's not going to walk and use that muscle a denotomy solves that problem in the cheapest way uh, it's worth it if it's like a ta con uh, spasticity it's not letting him do anything and he's convinced he's not going to stand and walk just a denotomy keeps brings it into plantar great position now, uh, coming to uh, expensive treatments like a neurotoxin injection, again, if it's a focal upper limb spasticity, it makes sense. Lower limb, the muscles are huge. You need a huge amount of dose and it will only work for four to six months, not worth it. So I usually don't do that. Uh, baclofen pump, yeah, it's brilliant. It works beautifully because it's giving you micrograms over 24 hours instead of milligrams uh, over 24 hours. And it's directly going into uh, the spine. Uh, you get very good results. Uh, again, expense is the problem. And uh, you need to find that patient who is really troubled by spasticity, who is not willing to take the medication, who's fed up of higher doses of baclofen or very drowsy with baclofen, those kind of patients. But because we have done two here, um, expense, not many takers uh, are there. Uh, but NHS, of course, they pay for it. So a lot of people go for it. How does it help? It does not help in standing and walking. It just relieves your spasticity so that you can comfortably sit in your bed or your chair and get on with life. I think walking and baclofen pump is probably a domain for cerebral palsy children, diplegics, who are there, who need a little bit of fine tuning of the spasticity to walk. So some surgeons are doing that in the pediatric population. But as a whole, in spinal cord injury, uh, not required for, not done for standing and walking. Uh, if I may give uh, the experience perspective. Uh, uh, so uh, when I started uh, after the spinal cord injury, uh, I'm highly spastic uh, and we've tried uh, phenol block, uh, Botox uh, works brilliantly well. But uh, again, as doctor said, uh, after three months, after six months, you'll have to do it again. Uh, ever since I started swimming, uh, and I also was uh, at uh, 90 uh, M uh, mg uh, baclofen daily and tisanidin. Uh, ever since I started swimming and started being active sitting on the wheelchair for longer hours, uh, and I had uh, high spastic uh, hip flexors and uh, adductors, but ever since I started doing that lying prone and doing some stretches by myself, uh, that has significantly come down and I'm uh, on 10 mg uh, per day baclofen. So keeping yourself active uh, kind of does away with uh, all medical intervention, especially swimming. Yeah. I just want to ask, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Dr. Well, Henry, uh, wonderful hearing you and uh, Vaibhi and Justin, good to see you all again after a while. So, uh, I've had an occasion to go to Chicago to see a commercial group called the Rewalk, the Rehabilitation Foundation. They're talking about bios, biofeedback sensors and things like that. So what is your take on that? And how far are we in India for that? Yeah, so in India, I think uh, if you're talking about exoskeletons, there are two companies which uh, uh, try to come in. Um, but again, uh, it's too expensive and it's not really functional. So if an institute can buy it and train patients to stand and walk, if they are recovering from Asia, C to D to E, it's worth it. But for individual, I think it's very expensive. Even the NHS cannot afford it. Uh, there also, I don't think people are using it. So uh, 
I think the battery technology, battery is huge. You have to carry the battery. Um, I don't think it's functional. It's therapeutic, yeah, if you want to stand and walk with it. So you have a, a cycle also in which you can actually do your both uh, uh, upper limb and lower limb with electrical stimulators, uh, functional electrical stimulators for cycling purpose. So all that is good. Like Justin said, it gives you a workout. It settles your spasticity. It settles your other medical issues. It makes you walk. So you get uh, some tangible benefits out of standing and walking. But functioning, am I able to go to the office with the exoskeleton every day and function for eight hours and come back? No, not yet. Okay. What about biosensor feedbacks which allow mobilization to happen? Uh, it, what we uh, from, from, from UCLA and from... Uh, uh, UC Davis, two centers which have been talking about uh, stimulating and biosensor feedbacks that allow people to actually move their limbs. Yeah, so we have tried an experiment here uh, with our bioengineering project where uh, um, FES uh, wheelchair was made where the patient could sit and uh, both his upper limbs and lower limbs uh, could be stimulated with the functional electrical stimulation and he could actually use the wheelchair. Uh, so, uh, in India, it's at a very basic level. In, I think, abroad, uh, there are sporting events where FES cycles are used, and there are prizes for the FES designer and for the participant, but I am not aware of uh, sensors and other technology coming in for activity and functional activity, not yet. So what, what do you think is going to be the future? Somebody has to do research on it. What what would you what did you think we should look ten years down the road? I think uh, the future right now, or the work, or the impetus is on bridging the gap with the spinal cord injury, whether it is with uh, electrodes or it with stem cells or pluripotent cells. I think people are just trying to bridge that gap with a graft, without a graft, whatever it may be. I think that's where the most of the money is put. Uh, as far as technology goes, I think uh, technology is there for. Uh, wheelchairs uh, and uh, assistive devices rather than for making somebody walk or jump. Assistive devices, there's a whole lot of things which have come in in the last uh, two decades, uh, which has made a huge difference. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, I think uh, it has been a great session. Um, the, I would like I would like to ask you and Dr. Nali Raj to give a you know, final closing take home message in, with the with the view of the, you know, orthopedic PGs and uh, fellows and spine surgeons who treat spinal injuries. Uh, doctor, before uh, closing yeah. remarks, just I'm going to take 40, 50 seconds. I'm really sorry about this. Um, it's fine. So, sure. so uh, uh, one of the things that I want to drive uh, as an idea here is uh, uh, one thing that is lacking in India, and uh, I'm quitting my corporate job, taking over, uh, you know, into the disability uh, sp uh, space uh, for spinal cord injury. One of the things that I feel that's lacking and that, uh, you know, all of you can support is uh, actually to create a registry that's missing in India. Uh, across uh, the globe, very few countries have it. None of the states in India have it. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe in Tamil Nadu or in Chennai, we can start it as a pilot project. And we can actually, you know, benefit from it because for future researches, it will be absolutely helpful from a surgeon standpoint, physician standpoint, and from the spinal foundation standpoint, it will help in improving the quality of life. Uh, maybe you can think about it and I can reach out to you a little later, but that's a request that I want to humbly submit. And the second thing is any help from a peer network significantly helps a spinal cord injured per, a person at an acute stage. And we are very happy to help you, uh, you know, uh, peer uh, volunteers come there and talk to them, push them uh, to achieve the desired results. Thank you so much. I'm also going to jump in and take 45 seconds. Uh, Dr. Nandi Uraj, uh, uh, one, Justin is the incoming CEO of the Spinal Foundation with effect from uh, 23rd of November. Uh, two, I think it would be great if uh, spine surgeons refer uh, any, the moment you come across anybody with a suspected spinal cord injury, if you refer them to us, we will ensure that they get the best possible guidance. Today, I can assure you that at least 100 people with spinal cord injury across the country, if you send people with spinal cord injury to their homes, they will get completely rehabilitated. They don't need to go to CMC Valor or SV Nanta. Users can do that. And third is uh, kindly, uh, I request all of you to practice the method of log rolling that is 
done at CMC Velour, I experienced that for two months. That log rolling method completely ensures that uh, there are no bed sores in the first two months. I think I'm sure Dr. Henry will be happy to share a video. Uh, and, and nobody who gets into that acute stage, it's a three people uh, process of log rolling. It works absolutely brilliantly. I think if spine surgeons can refer people to the network and ensure log rolling, I think uh, the rest of it, you can leave it to the users. We will take care of them. We will run and make sure that they do a great life. But these two steps, it is in the hands of the spine surgeons, the neurosurgeons, or the orthopedicians who do the spine surgery. And Dr. Nalini Yuvraj, I have because the Chennai Spine Society who focus on this in addition to the registry idea. Chennai can become a model city by setting up India's first uh, uh, spinal cord registry. We would like to work very closely with all of you, Dr. Nalini Yuvraj, Dr. Karthik Kailash, and others, and uh, make this a possibility. Once we showcase a replicable model, it will, can be easily uh, sold to the government and adapted across the country. Justin, me, and a few others, we are in talk with the Rick Hansen Foundation of Canada. We are going to be entering into a partnership with them for setting up the registry. So we are doing everything at our end. We request the spine surgeons and neurosurgeons and the, and the orthopedicians to join hands with Justin and take this forward. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Okay, that's uh, yeah, that's nice listening to uh, Justin and Vaidyanath, the, the conference with which they were uh, talking. I see, and uh, I surely would uh, put in our efforts to I mean, uh, establish the registry. I think that's a very good idea, and it can be done, in fact, in the uh, Government Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine itself. We can do it. Maybe I will get in touch with the Justin and Vaidyanath and, and then uh, take forward this effort. At the same time, I very encouraging to hear that Vaidyanath uh, can help. Uh, the spinal injured patient to, who come to uh, Rajiv Gandhi General Hospital, Hospital itself. Then definitely we'll utilize the services. And sure. uh, this is an information to us, actually, in fact. Yes, sure. Okay, sir, I think uh, we'll end up. Sudhir. So, Sudhir? Yes, sir. Dr. Murli, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, just just uh, two minutes. Uh, Dr. Henry, it was an impressive talk. Because uh, you have chosen the topic, you know, the after uh, suture removal, because you know we, we only deal with acute phase and you have taken us through what happens to the patient, how you transform their lives. So it is not single person, it is a team, so multi-team. And uh, it is very impressive to see that our survival rate of, uh, you know, the spinal cord injury patients is, you know, outstanding and, you know, above, well and above the uh, developed countries. Uh, uh, and it is very impressive to see. and. It's very nice to hear from Justin, you know, patient perspective. The word he said, the first message is the key message. How it is delivered and how, you know, what positive thoughts are given to are very important. And uh, and that is the message I think we, I want to highlight for our PGs and juniors. When you're seeing a spinal cord, severe spinal cord injury patient, how you deal, the first message, how you prepare them. Because I always say that you are going to have a new friend. as. Justin said he likes his, you know, he loves the wheelchair. I always say you have a new friend to build your new life. And uh, what are the, the things that we prepare in the first few days, you know, how we prepare, and that is very essential for their new life, I think, adaptation. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for that. And uh, Vaidinathan, sir, we know, you know, uh, the foundation and everything. So. Okay, so uh, uh, that was a wonderful session, as uh, said by others. And thanks, Dr. Henry, for being a part of this. And uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Justin and Mr. Vaidyanath and sir, uh, for sharing your experiences. And I would like to thank the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Uh, Karthi Kailash and Dr. Nalli Uraj, uh, for uh, excellent moderation and, be, and uh, always uh, uh, encouraging us uh, to move forward. So I think we'll close this session. Uh, so, and uh, Ask uh, Javed to give a word of thanks and a special thanks to Dr. Panikian for uh, continuous uh, uh, efforts in organizing this uh, session. So, Mr. Javed, you can take over. Good evening and uh, thank you, Dr. Sudhir. Um, uh, belated uh, Diwali wishes to everybody. And on the outset, uh, I would like to uh, uh, wish you all. Uh, very happy belated Diwali, as well as hope that you all are doing well, are safe and healthy during these 
uh, unusual times of pandemic as well. Uh, we have just uh, witnessed a wonderful uh, and, a, and a very informative webinar, which has been titled Rehabilitation After, Sp after a Spinal Cord Injury, which, which we all are aware that it has been done under the ages of Chennai Ortho Spine Society. And this was a fourth series, and uh, it has been a, a wonderful association and partnership we had with Chennai Ortho Spine Society. I represent Intas Pharmaceuticals, which has been dealing with uh, osteoporosis for almost a decade right now. Dr. Henry, Dr. Nallivraj made a wonderful presentation and well, very well moderated by Dr. Karthik Kailash, Dr. Fani Kiran, Dr. Sudhi, Dr. Murli, and Dr. Karuna Gran, sir. And also, um, there was a great value addition from Mr. Justin as well as Mr. Vaidyanathan. I would uh, uh, probably uh, share with you that Dr. Henry in his presentation uh, talked about bone health in paraplegia. Though we don't deal with paraplegia, but still osteoporosis is also a condition where bone health tends to be uh, deteriorated and uh, there is a urgent need to probably restore uh, 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 reducing down the future risk of vertebral compression fracture in these patients. So we provide a solution in the form of teriparatide, uh, which is India's truly biosimilar by the brand name Terifrac, uh, which was launched in 2010, which is almost dated. So we also have 10 years of glorious years in terms of providing bone health. Uh, very recently, we also made our treatment basket more comprehensive by launching world's first biosimilar denosumab, which is uh, by the brand name Volimab. So you have uh, given us your patronage and your support. And uh, uh, responding to that in this pandemic time, we have reduced down the price of teriparatide, uh, making it more affordable to your osteoporotic patients, which is going to cost only around 3,000 rupees per, pay, per month, uh, available in a pack of six months therapy as well. And uh, for monitoring, osteoporosis patients uh, still continues to be a very gray area. So uh, we are providing a free P1NP test, which is a bone formation market test at baseline. And after six months, wherein which you could see how the newborn form uh, enhancement has happened post treatment with teriparatide. And uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a free of cost test. It's an expensive test, but we do it for all your patients whom you recommend as well. So this is uh, from our side, uh, uh, academic partnership as well as patient services uh, with you. Thank you for all your endorsement and support and patronage for our products as well. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay then. Thank you. Thank you, Thank all. you all. Thank you. Dr. Henry. Dr. Henry. Yes, please. I yes, think please. We are, it just is not, uh, it's not any live telecast anymore, isn't it? We are done. It, it is live. It is live, sir. Now it is live. We are going to stop now. It, is, okay. it has after, been live. There are some. Can, can we have uh, after live a few minutes with Dr. Henry? If we, if they are they going to shut it? We, can we interact? Uh, Dr. Neeraj, uh, can, Dr. Neeraj, can you take us offline? Uh, Dr. Neeraj? Yeah, I think it looks like he's, he's gone. No? He's, uh, it looks like he's it's offline. There. He's there, but uh, I don't know whether we are still online or off. We can check. Maybe Dr. Murli can talk to Dr. Henry directly. I'll, say, I'll share your uh, number with him. Okay. Right. Dr. Murli, just, I'll send you his number. It, it, okay. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. Because we have addressed this lot of, you know, uh, this thing, but one comrade has not been addressed. I just want to know how they deal with that, uh, you know, the young patients or dear patients. It's just out of the box. Young patients. You know, you know we have touched the, you know, the physical, psychological, social, vocational, everything. But how they're dealing with the, uh, you know, the sexual side component of the patient, because most of them are young patients. I had a chap uh, who was 10 years uh, post uh, spinal cord and he just married. Uh, and I had another one, 18 years old. Uh, now, a recent one, younger chap. So how these guys, how you are preparing, you know, how if this is being addressed by your team? Yeah. That's why I just thought uh want to touch base uh, how you guys uh yeah so um uh, again it's a, a topic which many people don't open with um young males and females nobody wants to talk about it though i'm mm. sure it is there in the front of their mind it's not at the mm. back of the mind mm. Mm. Uh, 
but unfortunately nobody comes forward and we struggle to find privacy to do these things uh, but of course uh, we do evaluate uh, for uh, uh, their uh, psychogenic erection reflex erection talk to them about relationships uh, tell them about the injury what the injury has caused and why this is happening in the way it is um so as far as the medical bit is concerned i think uh, again uh, we do try some uh, citrocelinophil citrate and tadalafil and all that if there's partial uh, erection already there to see if that can augment it uh, we do regularly uh, do um, papaverin injections to have a feel of so that they can get a feel of what a papaverin injection is um unfortunately not all respond very well with papaverin injections uh, probably because of chronicity or uh, kind of neural injury they have uh, some of them do have significant uh, benefit with it occasionally we have tried i have prescribed uh, prostaglandins also intraurethral uh, so so to keep that away um uh, i think uh, what we uh, uh, tend to do is educate them a lot and then they do most of it on their own um many of them do not come back uh, and ask specific questions on that we have to have leading questions but again um, uh, both justin and vaidhi will tell you there has been successful people who have gone back and had a family go ahead justin you can tell what you did sure uh, thanks thanks uh, doctor and uh, uh, so uh, my experience and uh, our experience talking to fellow peers as well uh, yes uh, from an erection standpoint we uh, you know uh, direct them to the doctors for uh, the medication uh, there is also uh, penile rings that you have once uh, because getting erection uh, more often is easy but sustaining the erection is where the challenge is so uh, there is a recommendation of uh, penile uh, rings uh, but uh, with caution and care uh, to not extend it beyond a point in time uh, uh, that that is a possibility there is also a pump a vacuum pump that you can use for erection um, and uh, also uh, apart from erection uh, obviously use of verticare or any uh, high frequency vibrator for ejaculation uh, what uh, needs to be treaded with caution is uh, retrograde uh, ej- ejaculation or uh, you know a normal ejaculation and uh, for uh, tc and above there is a possibility of autonomic dysreflexia so we suggest that uh, they sit uh, while at uh, the time of uh, ejaculation so that uh, as dr henry was saying that that helps in uh, you know uh, not affecting the brain Uh, but we also break it down to two different components one is uh, do you want it for sexuality and pleasure and do you want to start a family we break it down uh, my experience and suggestion would be uh, if it is a young uh, a paraplegic or a quadriplegic who is not looking at marriage or there is a possibility of delay in marriage uh, uh, both male and female uh, uh, the suggestion of uh, storing their uh, sperm and egg uh, because as they get late uh, older in life uh, the quality of egg usually deteriorates that's one of my experience because i recently uh, had uh, twins uh, through ivf so that is one recommendation ivf or iui uh, to start a family uh, for uh, sexuality and pleasure uh, there are different aids that help in positioning uh, 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 the person with the spinal cord injury in the right position so there are there are different positions uh, uh, to actually have intercourse uh, we recommend all of those uh, things and we provide material to suggest how to go about it because one of the things that i've realized uh, or we've realized is uh, sexuality although not spoken uh, uh, to the professionals to the healthcare professionals is one of the biggest issues and challenges that people face because uh, uh, to to keep the family together because a lot of relationship issues uh, then start so it is a key component very vital component uh, that uh, you know we we talk about very actively with our peers because they they open up really well uh, with the peers uh but that said um, and and some people experience uh, orgasm at the level of injury i don't know uh, i've not personally faced it but a lot of uh, quadriplegics say that uh, you know uh, that needs to be explored uh, but there have been different experiences but uh, we absolutely encourage people to have this conversation uh, dr mushi and henry sorry i brought this up i should have brought this up before you know when we are all online but we, we being do- you know the medical profession and you be you know the the you know the patient advisors we ourselves feel not comfortable but this is the very important component in a young, young adult uh, where you know uh, as to be that's why i just wanted to know how your team prepares them and when you you know how the, brings it in how you oh, just 
Yeah. So at times I have uh, here in rehab, if there is a single room free, and uh, uh, I'm going to try an intervention or ask the patient to use the vibrator which we have here, uh, or a drug or the injection. Um, we have asked the couple to take that room for the night and try uh, sexual intercourse and tell us what uh, happened. So again, those things are very rare, but I have done it here. And it, that happens regularly in the West where the patient and the partner is let out onto a, a separate uh, uh, enclosure where they can try it out and come back and tell the problem so that we can see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, totally in the last one month, uh, one of our peers, Imran Khan from Maharashtra, he's a father of a two-year-old child. Yes. He's an absolute expert on this topic and uh, he's had uh, calls on sexuality appropriation with about 35 people with spinal cord injury from different parts of India. So including uh, 11 from Tamil Nadu. Some of these are one-to-one -one calls and some of these are group calls. And even for ejaculation, uh, Imran Khan now recommends a device called Vibarek, which actually helps you to uh, control the ejaculation and uh, with or without an erection. And uh, that enables procreation. And at 35,000 rupees, it is way cheaper like one of our friends in Tamil Nadu went to a fertility clinic they said please give us 18,500 rupees for a two hour orientation session and nothing else will happen yeah I think in short the way forward is the spinal foundation and uh, keep connecting with the spinal foundation yeah, yeah, registry yeah, 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 yeah. registry and if we network ourselves together I think a lot more can be done I think thank you numbers to me we will ensure that uh, they get guided well uh, thank all. I think we, we, we are, Dr. Murali, you are not late. Your question, is st we are still online and it has all been recorded. Oh, so awesome. great, great guys. It's, thank uh, you. Thank you. It's, a, it's a pleasure to be a part of this and thank you all. Yeah. I think we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.